Good morning. My name is Barbara Weissman, and I'm here to talk about principles of fracture fixation. I'd like to take a minute to just thank Dr. Michael Weaver for his expertise in orthopedics, which he uh, used to help me with this program. I know that you're used to looking at patients who are in casts and splints. Plaster is shown on the left and fiberglass on the right. But today we're going to talk mostly about operative treatments, including external fixation and internal fixation. External fixators are attached to bone via pins, and then they're connected to a frame which allows the position to be maintained. External fixators are used in patients who have open fractures, with soft tissue injuries, patients who have multiple injuries, and for limb lengthening. In this uh, second patient, you can see the effects of limb lengthening with bone growing in to fill this gap and the use of this complex frame called an Ilizarov frame. Complications of external fixation relate to the pins, including loosening, breakage, and infection. Internal fixation includes uh, these basic four types, wires, screws, plates, and intramedullary nails or rods. In this example on the right, you can see wires used to attach a greater trochanter and the adjacent soft tissues through a mesh to bone. Wires are also used uh, to compress a fracture site. This is called the tension band principle, and it's used in areas such as the knee and the elbow, where muscular forces tend to pull the fracture apart. The tension band principle, then, is shown on the left that flexing, for example, the knee produces tension forces or tensile forces through the quadriceps and patellar tendons. And using this eccentric anterior wire, these forces are converted to compression forces at the fracture site, and that's shown diagrammatically on the right. The tension forces pulling the knee apart, the tension band reducing those forces and allowing compression at the fracture. So you expect this tension band to be on the tensile side so here's an example of a patella fracture, and you can see on the left, uh, the arrows indicate the pull that separates the fracture fragments, and on the right, the eccentrically placed, anteriorly placed tension band, which uh, serves to produce compression forces more posteriorly. Wires are also used uh, to go around bone, particularly in the femur, and these are called cerclage wires. Cerclage wires shown on the left have twisted ends, which you can see. More recently, they've been using uh, cables, cerclage cables, and you can identify them because the ends are crimped together, and so you can uh, see that that looks different than the twists. Complications of wires include breakage, interruption of periosteal blood supply, and that would produce uh, bone resorption under the wires. Wires are also used to temporarily fix fractures. As you see here, these two K wires are maintaining the length of the fourth metacarpal while that fourth metacarpal fracture heals. They're also used as guides for cannulated screws and for traction. Percutaneous pins, shown here, protrude through the skin and therefore the possibility of infection is a, a real one. The other complications include pin migration, so make sure you look carefully at pin position on follow-up examinations. After wires, we're going to talk about screws. So screws convert rotational forces into linear motion. Screws are described in several ways, but one of the most important ways is the pitch, which relates to the uh, distance between the screw threads. This will indicate the length traveled by the screw with each 360 degree turn. Smaller, uh, shorter pitch is called fine pitch and longer, uh, more distant threads are called coarse pitch. The more distance there is between the threads, the more likely it is to be able to grab on uh, cancellous bone. There are three main types of screws, cancella screws, cortical screws, and locking head screws. Cancella screws have deeper threads 
larger thread diameters, greater pitch, and usually are partially threaded to produce a lag screw effect. In contrast, cortical screws are usually fully threaded. They have small thread diameters and pitch, and they use mostly in the diaphyses, often to uh, fix plates to bone. Notice that one of these screws, at least, is seen to traverse the medial cortex, as you see here, and that's actually a desired effect for the screw to go through two cortices, and it's possible that these other two screws also go through a cortex that's not seen in profile. Unless this uh, impinges greatly on the soft tissues, it's uh, usually an unexpected finding. The third kind of screw is called the locking head screw, and you may be able to see these small threaded areas in the head of the screw that screw into the plate. These also have larger diameters, shallow threads, and often blunt edges. These uh, screws can be used as lag screws, which function to bring the fracture fragments together. Usually a lag screw has this configuration. It's smooth in the shank, and the distal threads are far apart. So as you screw in this screw, the distal part engages the bone and forces the fracture fragments together against the screw head. If the screw is fully threaded, then you can overdrill the proximal part of the screw so that it doesn't engage the bone, and only the distal part will engage the bone. There are several kinds of screws that you will see, so we're going to go through them briefly. The so-called cannulated screws are hollow inside and allow them to be placed over guide wires, and the typical place for this is in the femur. Headless compression screws are shown in these two pictures. On the left is a Herbert screw. The threads proximally and distally are different. This is very close together, and these are far apart allowing the fracture fragments to come together when this screw is inserted. Notice that the heads of the screws then are buried so that the joints adjacent to them are not affected. The screw on the right has a variable uh, changing pitch, and this produces a similar effect to bring the fracture, or in this case, the fusion site, together. Interference screws are used particularly for anterior cruciate ligament reconstructions that are of the bone patellar tendon bone type. So bone, as you know, the bone from the patella, bone from the patellar ligament, and bone from the tibial tubercle can be harvested and then inserted in the tract of where the ACL should be. So here's the bone proximally. This is the tract of where the soft tissue of the patellar ligament would be. And here's the bone of the distal uh, part of the tibia. These uh, bone uh, areas are held inside tunnels by these interference screws, which actually push the bone to the end of the, to the edge of the tunnel, securing it. Interference screws can be made of metal, as you see on the left, but they can also be biodegradable and barely visible, as you see on the right. So there are several uses to screws. The first is the interfragmentary compression, or lag screw, which brings the fracture fragments together. The second is to attach plates to bone. The third is to hold two bones in proper relationships, such as the syndesmonic screw. The next is uh, intramedullary locking uh, screws, which uh, affix the intramedullary nail to the cortices called interlocking screws. And the next is to block the movement of a main fracture fragment about an intramedullary nail, and that's called polar screws. In this case, you can see the fracture, unreduced fracture on the left and the reduced and uh, fixed fracture on the right. We have an interfragmentary screw across the ulnar fracture, as you see here. The fracture uh, line should be traversed by the screw so that the screw is perpendicular to the fracture line. It, in this case, should be over-drilled so it functions as a lag screw compressing the fracture. This is an example of a plate being fixed to bone and also of the so-called syndesmonic screws that you see here attaching the tibia and the fibula. Syndesmonic screws are under stress because the syndesmosis normally moves, and often these syndesmonic screws are removed. 
Another proposal is to use the so-called tightrope or suture button technique, which allows cables to be passed between the tibia and the fibula and anchored on either side. And uh, this construct does not need to be removed, although it often is. The next screw use is the so-called interlocking screw, which locks an intramedullary nail to the cortices, as you see here, to increase its stability. And finally, the polar screw, which blocks the movement of a main fracture fragment about an intramedullary nail. And this screw then will not go through any of the holes in the intramedullary rod. Uh, it's next to the rod, as you see here. We're going to go through a few hip fractures because that's commonly seen. In this case of an impacted valgus impacted fracture, you can see the use of uh, cannulated cancellous screws these screws are parallel in position. They're put in over guide wires, and they do not cross the um, threads, do not cross the fracture site. The inferior screw is supposed to rest on the femoral calcar. Notice that the fracture itself is sometimes not reduced because this is a position of stability. Transcervical fractures that are displaced can be fixed by a sliding hip screw shown here. This is the sliding hip screw. This screw is made to slide into the barrel of this plate as fracture uh, healing occurs and bone resorption occurs. And that's supposed to stop the head of this screw from uh, transgressing into the joint space. Often a parallel derotational screw is placed before the hip screw uh, is put into control rotation. Extracapsular fractures can be fixed with cephalomedullary nails, such as you see here, with an interlocking screw distally and a compression screw proximally. Complications of screw fixation include backing out, change in position, fracture, penetration into a joint or cutting out, disengagement of a sliding screw, loosening, and infection. This is an example of cutting out of a sliding hip screw. The picture on the left shows apparently uh, uncomplicated appearance. On the right, you can see that the fracture has collapsed into varus. You can see the lucency where the screw head used to be, and now the screw is cutting out uh, laterally from the femoral head. In this case of an intertrochanteric fracture with a cephalomedullary nail, you can see that the nail on follow-up, has penetrated into the joint. So we have to spend a couple of minutes talking about how you know that the tip of a screw is in a joint or not, because that can be a difficult problem radiographically. So the question is, is the screw tip in the joint? And there are two uh, ways to look at this. One is for convex surfaces like the femoral head and the Taylor dome. In these round surfaces, if a screw projects into the joint, as you see here in this example, even if it's only on one projection, it's definitely abnormal and it's in the joint. Even though multiple other views or fluoroscopy may make it look like it's not in the joint. So the rules for penetration of the femoral head by a pin include uh, it's often not apparent on two views. The penetration may not be visible even on fluoroscopy. And it turns out that eight millimeters distance between the subcontral bone and the tip of the screw on uh, various projections is enough to make pretty sure that this is not going to be in the joint. In a case like this, where on fluoroscopy you can see how close the screw head is to the uh, joint and to the subcontral bone, you can't really be sure that in another view it wouldn't penetrate into the joint. And here's just a sort of example of an experimental case in which you can see the tips of the femoral uh, screws don't look as though they've penetrated through into the joint on these two images. And yet in the uh, cadaver specimen, you can see that the screw tip is definitely outside of the bone. So if you see that it's, it's passing the cortex uh, and apparent, appears to be violating the subcontral bone and going into the joint, even on one view, that's abnormal. If this is a round contour, such as the Taylor head or the femoral head.
In contrast, for concave structures such as the acetabulum or the distal radius, the screw can appear to be in the joint on some of the views, but if it projects out of the joint on even one view, then it's okay. So here's our uh, case intraoperatively. You can see all the screws and plates. You can see the screw. Here's the joint. It appears that this screw could be in the joint. But when you turn the patient, you can see that screw is anterior. Here's the joint. So no, the screw is not in the joint. Other complications of screws include loosening. Loosening is identified by seeing a uh, dark zone around the screw, especially if it's two millimeters or more. And usually that dark zone is differentiated from just osteopenia by the presence of a thin white line adjacent to it, such as you see here. The wider the zone, the more likely it is to be loose. In this case, these screws have also backed out. Screw fracture can be seen as in this case, these syndesmonic screws, we said motion occurs at the syndesmosis, and so this is uh, not totally unexpected. It doesn't always have to be revised. Breakage of screws can be uh, flagrant as it is in this case, or it can be kind of difficult to see as it is in this case. You can see the bending and actually the fracture of this screw. And it can be uh, seen only if you turn the patient so that you're perpendicular to the fracture, as you see here. Infection of screws is uh, demonstrated by loosening with a loosened zone around the screw. But the white line that we saw around an aseptically loose screw can be not present in patients who have infection. Also, the presence of periosteal reaction can be seen with infection and not usually with, uh, with aseptic loosening, at least not this irregular periosteal reaction. Next, we're going to talk about plates. So there are several functions of plates. The neutralization plate across simple fractures treated with a lag screw, that plate will neutralize rotational stress. The compression plate used in simple transverse fractures to compress the fracture. In those fractures, callus formation is minimal and fracture healing occurs directly across the fracture site. The third one is the buttress plate which is used in partial articular joint fractures and compresses the fracture fragments. The fourth one is bridging plates, which bypass a comminuted fracture. Fifth is anti-glide plate, which prevents overriding of fracture fragments. And sixth is tension band plate, which is similar to a tension band wire in its um, effect. You can tell functions of plates by looking at the entire construct, but we usually, as radiologists, do not necessarily dictate this. You can see on the right the case we saw before with a lag screw across the fracture site. This is then a neutralization plate. On the radius, there's a plate bringing these two uh, fracture fragments together in this simple fracture that will produce compression at the fracture site and will allow healing to occur with minimal callus formation. That's a compression plate. This is a buttress plate. This is a bridge plate, which goes across this very comminuted fracture. It's not fixing the fracture fragments. It's bypassing the fracture and holding it in place. There are some plates that we can identify by the way they look, and this is the major one, the so-called reconstruction plate. This is malleable and uh, therefore is used in surfaces that are complicated, such as in the pelvis. And finally, intramedullary nails or rods. These uh, are held to the adjacent bone uh, by interlocking screws. It's termed statically locked if the interlocking screws are at both the proximal and distal ends of the rods. And that's usually used when the fracture is highly comminuted so that if you stood up, the fracture margins would be uh, brought together and the fracture would shorten. Dynamically locked. Interlocking screws at only one end allow compression of the fracture when you stand. And dynamization refers to removing of an interlocking set of screws at one end, allowing the fracture to compress. This is an example, then, of a comminuted fracture held by a retrograde nail with proximal and distal interlocking screws. Noted that it's retrograde because you can see the tip of the screw is proximal and it's inserted uh, from the distal end. There are interlocking screws both distally and proximally because this is a highly comminuted fracture that would shorten otherwise. 
Complications of intramedullary rods include change in bone length, distraction of the fracture fragments, hardware fracture, loosening, or infection. I don't know if you see anything wrong with this uh, frontal radiograph of an intramedullary rod, but remember you always have to have two views, and on the lateral view you can easily see the disruption in the rod, so remember always to get two views. And just a word about uh, areas of increased density that are seen near fractures. Autographs and allografts can be used to uh, augment areas of absent bone. Calcium phosphate cement, such as seen in this case, can produce areas of increased density. And also in areas of infection, antibiotic impregnated beads can be used, and you see them here. They are dense, often round, and fill uh, the area of infection. This allows high uh, quantities of antibiotics to go into these local soft tissues. And just to finish up, I wanted to show you this, well, these densities, which are not antibiotic beads. These are uh, ice cubes in an ice pack, and so don't confuse that appearance. So that's it for our quick run-through of uh, internal fixation of fractures. So thank you very much.